there. Welcome back. Today I'm going to do a read aloud for you. And I have this amazing, very old book, which I am going to read from. Show you the spine here. It's called Birds That Every Child Should Know. And it was written by a woman named Nelchi Blanchan in 1907. And you may have noticed um, in some of my other videos that on my bookshelf behind me, I have a few books that have um, this library book um, little number emblazoned on there. And um, just so that you know that I am not a library book thief, um, I was working on a job a number of years ago where a school library was being consolidated and there were some old books that were up for grabs. So I took a few of them and the reason I chose this book is because I am a big bird lover. I love songbirds and I love um, identifying them and learning more about them. And I just love the concept of this book. There are a lot of birds discussed in this book. It's like 20 chapters of birds. And I love the idea that these were basic things that, you know, every child should know about all these birds. And her style of writing is really lovely because she provides a lot of scientific information um, in a very poetic way. And so I really enjoyed reading this book. And I wanted to share it with you. Today I'm going to read the preface and the first chapter, which is about robins and their relatives, and then I will probably record some of the other chapters later on. So I hope this read aloud will help you relax, maybe help you drift into sleep, and I hope you enjoy it. Birds that Every Child Should Know by Nelchi Blanchan Copyright 1907 by Doubleday, Page and Company Preface If all his lessons were as joyful as learning to know the birds in the fields and the woods, there would be no whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face creeping like a snail unwillingly to school. Long before his nine o'clock headache appears, lessons have begun. Nature herself is the teacher who rouses him from his bed with an outburst of song under the window and sets his sleepy brain to wondering whether it was a robin's clear ringing call that startled him from his dreams, or the chipping sparrow's wily tremolo, or the gushing little wren's tripping cadenza. Interest in the birds trains the ear quite unconsciously. A keen, intelligent listener is rare, even among grown-ups. But a child who is becoming acquainted with the birds about him hears every sound and puzzles out its meaning with a cleverness that amazes those with ears who hear not. He responds to the first alarm note from the nesting bluebirds in the orchard and dashes out of the house to chase away a prowling cat. He knows from afar the distress cause of a company of crows and away he goes to be sure that their persecutor is a hawk. A faint tattoo in the woods sends him climbing up a tall straight tree with the confident expectation of finding a woodpecker's nest within the hole in its side. While training his ears, nature is also training every muscle in his body sending him on long tramps across the fields in pursuit of a new bird to be identified, making him run and jump fences 
and wade brooks and climb trees with the zest that produces an appetite like a sawmill's and deep sleep at the close of a happy day. When President Roosevelt was a boy, he was far from strong, and his anxious father and mother naturally encouraged every interest that he showed in out-of-door pleasures. Among these, perhaps the keenest that he had was in birds. He knew the haunts of every species within a wide radius of his home, and made a large collection of eggs and skins that he presented to the Smithsonian Museum when he could no longer endure the evidence of his youthful indiscretion, as he termed the collector's mania. But those bird hunts that had kept him happily employed in the open air all day long helped to make him the strong man he is, whose wonderful physical endurance is not the least factor of his greatness. No one abhors the killing of birds and the robbing of nests more than he. Few men, not specialists, know so much about bird life. Nature, the best teacher of us all, trains the child's eyes through study of the birds to quickness and precision, which are the first requisites for all intelligent observation in every field of knowledge. I know boys who can name a flock of ducks when they are mere specks twinkling in their rapid rush across the autumn sky, and girls who instantly recognize a goldfinch by its waving flight above the garden. The white band across the end of the kingbird's tail leads to his identification the minute some sharp young eye perceives it. At a considerable distance, a little girl I know distinguished a white-eyed from a red-eyed vireo, not by the color of the iris of either bird's eye, but by the yellowish-white bars on the white-eyed vireo's wings, which she had noticed at a glance. Another girl named the yellow-billed cuckoo, almost hidden among the shrubbery, by the white thumbnail spots on the quills of his outspread tail, where it protruded for a second from a mass of leaves. A little boy from the New York City slums was the first to point out to his teacher, who had lived twenty years on a farm, the faint reddish streaks on the breast of a yellow warbler in Central Park. Many there are who have eyes and see not. What does the study of birds do for the imagination, that high power possessed by humans alone, that lifts them upward step by step into new realms of discovery and joy? If the thought of a tiny hummingbird, a mere atom in the universe, migrating from New England to Central America, will not stimulate a child's imagination, then all the tales of fairies and giants and beautiful princesses and wicked witches will not cause his sluggish fancy to roam. Poetry and music, too, would fail to stir it out of the deadly commonplace. Interest in bird life exercises the sympathies. The child reflects something of the joy of the oriole, whose ecstasy of song from the elm on the lawn tells the whereabouts of a dangling cup of felt with its deeply hidden treasure. He takes to heart the tragedy of a robin's mud-plastered nest in an apple tree that was washed apart by a storm, and experiences something akin to remorse when he takes the mother bird from the jaws of his pet cat. He listens for the return of the bluebirds to the starch box home he made for them on top of the grape arbor, and is strangely excited and happy that bleak day in March when they reappear. It is nature's sympathy, the growth of the heart, not nature's study, the training of the brain, that does most for us. Nelchi Blanchan, Mill Neck. 1906.
Chapter 1 Our Robin Goodfellow and His Relations Robin, Bluebird, Wood Thrush, Wilson's Thrush It is only when he is a baby that you could guess our Robin is really a thrush. For then the dark speckles on his plump little yellowish-white breast are prominent thrush-like markings, which gradually fade, however, as he grows old enough to put on a brick-red vest like his father's. The European cock-robin, a bird as familiar to you as our own, no doubt, because it was he who was killed by the sparrow with the bow and arrow, you well remember, and it was he who covered the poor babes in the wood with leaves, is much smaller than our robin, even smaller than a sparrow, and he is not a thrush at all. But this hero of the storybooks has a red breast, and the English colonists who settled this country named our big, cheerful, lusty bird neighbor a robin, simply because his red breast reminded them of the wee little bird at home that they had loved when they were children. When our American robin comes out of the turquoise blue egg that his devoted mother has warmed into life, he usually finds three or four baby brothers and sisters huddled within the grassy cradle. In April, both parents worked hard to prepare this home for them. Having brought coarse grasses, roots, and a few leaves or weed stalks for the foundation, and pellets of mud in their bills for the inner walls, which they cleverly managed to smooth into a bowl shape without a mason's trowel, and fine grasses for the lining of the nest, they saddled it onto the limb of an old apple tree. Robins prefer low-branching orchard or shade trees near our homes to the tall, straight shafts of the forest. Some have the courage to build among the vines or under the shelter of our piazzas. I know a pair of robins that reared a brood in a little clipped bay tree in a tub next to a front door, where people passed in and out continually. Doubtless very many birds would be glad of the shelter of our comfortable homes if they could only trust us. Is it not a shame that they cannot? Robins, especially, need a roof over their heads. When they foolishly saddle their nest onto an exposed limb of a tree, the first heavy rain is likely to soften the mud walls and wash apart the heavy, bulky structure, then down tumble babies and cradle and all. It is wiser of them to fit the nest into the supporting crotch of a tree, as many do, and wisest to choose the top of a piazza pillar, where boys and girls and cats cannot climb to molest them, nor storms dissolve their mud-walled nursery. There are far too many tragedies of the nests after every heavy spring rain. Suppose your appetite were so large that you were compelled to eat more than your weight of food every day, and suppose that you had three or four brothers and sisters, just your own size, and just as ravenously hungry. These are the conditions in every normal robin family, so you can easily imagine how hard the father and mother birds must work to keep their fledglings' crops filled. No wonder robins like to live near our homes, where the enriched land contains many fat grubs, and the smooth lawns that they run across so lightly make hunting for earthworms comparatively easy. It is estimated that about 14 feet of worms, if placed end to end, are drawn out of the ground daily by a pair of robins with a nest full of babies to feed. When one of the parents alights near its home, every child must have seen the little heads with wide-stretched yellow bills pop up suddenly like jacks in the box. How rudely the greedy babies push and jostle one another to get the most dinner, 
and how noisily they clamor for it. Earthworms are the staff of life to them, just as bread is to children. But robins destroy vast quantities of other worms and insects more injurious to the farmer's crops, so that the strawberries and cherries they take in June should not be grudged them. A man of science, who devoted many hours of study to learn the great variety of sounds made by common barnyard chickens in expressing their entire range of feeling, from the eggshell to the axe, could entertain an audience delightfully for an evening by imitating them. Similar study applied to robins would reveal a surprisingly rich result, but probably less funny. No bird that we have has so varied a repertoire as Robin Goodfellow, and I do not believe that any boy or girl could recognize him by every one of his calls and songs. His softly warbled salute to the sunrise differs from his lovely evening song just as widely as the rapturous melody of his courting days differs from the more subdued, tranquil love song to his brooding mate. Indignation, suspicion, fright, interrogation, peace of mind, hate, caution to take flight, these and a host of other thoughts are expressed through his flexible voice. Toward the end of June, you may see robins flying in flocks after sundown. Old males and young birds of the first brood scatter themselves over the country by day to pick up the best living they can, but at night they collect in large numbers at some favorite roosting place. Oftentimes the weary mother birds are now raising second broods. We like to believe that the fathers return from the roosts at sunup to help supply these insatiable babies with worms throughout the long day. After family cares are over for the year, robins molt, and then they hide, mope, and keep silent for a while. But in September, in a suit of new feathers, they are feeling vigorous and cheerful again, and gathering in friendly flocks, they roam about the woodland borders to feed on the dogwood, choke cherries, juniper berries, and other small fruits. You see, they change their diet with the season. By dropping the undigested berry seeds far and wide, they plant great numbers of trees and shrubs as they travel. Birds help to make the earth beautiful. With them, every day is Arbor Day. It is a very dreary time when the last robin leaves us, and an exceptionally cold winter when a few stragglers from the southbound flocks do not remain in some sheltered, sunny, woodland hollow. The Bluebird Is there any sign of spring quite so welcome as the glint of the first bluebird, unless it is his softly whistled song? Before the farmer begins to plow the wet earth, often while the snow is still on the ground. This hardy little minstrel is making himself very much at home in our orchards and gardens while waiting for a mate to arrive from the south. Now is the time to have ready, on top of the grape arbor, or under the eaves of the barn, or nailed up in the apple tree, or set up on poles, the little one-roomed houses that bluebirds are only too happy to occupy. More enjoyable neighbors it would be hard to find. Sparrows will fight for the boxes, it is true, but if there are plenty to let, and the sparrows are persistently driven off, the bluebirds, which are a little larger, though far less bold, quickly take possession. Birds that come earliest in the season and feed on insects before they have time to multiply, are of far greater value in the field, orchard, and garden 
and birds that delay their return until warm weather has brought forth countless swarms of insects, far beyond the control of either bird or man. Many birds would be of even greater service than they are if they received just a little encouragement to make their homes nearer ours. They could save many more millions of dollars worth of crops for the farmers than they do if they were properly protected while rearing their ever-hungry families. As two or even three broods of bluebirds may be raised in a box each spring, and as insects are their most approved baby food, we see how much it is to our interest to set up nurseries for them near our homes. But when people are not thoughtful enough to provide them before the first of March, the bluebirds hunt for a cavity in a fence rail or a hole in some old tree, preferably in the orchard, shortly after their arrival, and proceed to line it with grass. From three to six pale blue eggs are laid. At first, the babies are blind, helpless, and almost naked. Then they grow a suit of dark feathers, with their speckled, thrush-like vests, similar to their cousins, the baby robins. And it is not until they are able to fly that the lovely deep blue shade gradually appears on their grayish upper parts. Then their throat, breast, and sides turn rusty red. While creatures are helpless, a prey for any enemy to pounce upon, nature does not dress them conspicuously, you may be sure. Adult birds that are able to look out for themselves may be very gaily dressed, but their children must wear somber clothes until they grow strong and wise. Young bluebirds are far less wild and noisy than robins, but their very sharp little claws discourage handling. These pointed hooks on the ends of their toes help them to climb out of the tree hollow that is their natural home into the big world that their presence makes so cheerful. As you might expect of creatures so heavenly in color, the disposition of bluebirds is particularly angelic. Gentleness and amiability are expressed in their soft, musical voice. Truly, truly, they sweetly assert when we can scarcely believe that spring is here. And tur wee, tur wee, they softly call in autumn, when they go roaming through the countryside in flocks of azure, or whirl through southern woods to feed on the waxy berries of the mistletoe. The wood thrush, called also song thrush, wood robin, bell bird. Much more shy and reserved than the social democratic robin is his cousin the wood thrush, whom, perhaps, you more frequently hear than see. Not that he is a recluse, like the hermit thrush, who hides his nest and lifts up his heavenly voice in deep, cool forest solitude. Nor is he even so shy as Wilson's thrush, who prefers to live in low, wet, densely overgrown northern woods. The wood thrush, as his name implies, certainly likes the woodland, but very often he chooses to stay close to our country in suburban homes or within city parks with a more than half-hearted determination to be friendly. He is about two inches shorter than the robin. Above, his feathers are a rich cinnamon brown, brightest on his head and shoulders, and shading into olive brown on his tail. His white throat and breasts and sides are heavily marked with heart-shaped marks of very dark brown. He has a white eye ring. Here I am, come his three clear, bell-like notes of self-introduction. The quality of his music is delicious, rich, penetrative, pure, 
and vibrating like notes struck upon a harp. If you don't already know this most neighborly of the thrushes, as he is also the largest and brightest and most heavily spotted of them all, you will presently become acquainted with one of the finest songsters in America. Wait until evening when he sings at his best. Nolieo, li nolieo e, peels his song from the trees. Love alone inspires his finest strains. But even in July, when bird music is quite inferior to that of May and June, he is still in good voice. A song so exquisite proves that the thrush comes near to being a bird angel, very high in the scale of development, and far, far beyond such low creatures as ducks and chickens. Pit, 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 you may hear sharply, excitedly jerked out of some bird's throat, and you wonder if a note so disagreeable can really come from the wonderful songster on the branch above your head. By sharply striking two small stones together, you can closely imitate this alarm call. Whom can he be scolding so severely? It is yourself, of course, for without knowing it, you have come nearer to his low nest in the beach than he thinks is quite safe. While sitting, the mother bird is, however, quite tame. A photographer I know placed his camera within four feet of a nest, changed the plates, and clicked the shutter three times for as many pictures without disturbing the gentle sitter who merely winked her eye at each chick. Wood thrushes seem to delight in weaving bits of paper or rags into their deep cradles, which otherwise resemble the robins. A nest in the shrubbery near a bird lover's home in New Jersey had many bits of newspaper attached to its outer walls, but the most conspicuous strip in front advertised in large letters, a house to be let or sold. The original builders happily took the next lease, and another lot of nervous, fidgety baby tenants came out of the four light greenish-blue eggs. But, as usual, they moved away to the woods after ten days, to join the choir invisible. Wilson's Thrush The Veery, as the Wilson's Thrush is called in New England, is far more common there than the Wood Thrush, whose range is more southerly. During its spring and fall migrations only is it at all common about the elms and maples that men have planted. Take a good look at its tawny coat and lightly spotted cream buff breast before it goes away to hide. Like Kipling's cat that walked by himself, the Veery prefers the wild, wet woods, and there its ringing, weird, whistling monotone that is so melodious without being a melody seems to come from you can't guess where. The singer keeps hidden in the dense, dark undergrowth. It is as if two voices, an alto and a soprano, were singing at the same time. Wee you, wee you. The familiar notes might come from a scythe being sharpened on a whetstone, or the sound less musical than it is. The bird is too wise to sing very near its well-hidden nest, which is placed either directly on the damp ground, or not far above it, and usually near water. Throughout its life, the Veery seems to show a distrust of us that, try as we may, few have ever overcome. If you have thought that the thrush-like, cinnamon-browned, speckle-breasted bird, with a long, twitching tail like a catbird's, and a song as fine as a catbird's best, would be mentioned among the robin's relations, you must guess again for he is the brown thrasher, not a thrush at all. You will find him in Chapter 3 in the group of lively singers. That concludes Chapter 1, and perhaps we'll continue in another video with Chapter 2.
some neighborly acrobats. Thank you for being here and listening. Rest well. Take good care.